Welcome everyone to the 185th 988 Crisis Jam. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. We're gonna be talking about medication assisted treatment or MAT services. Uh, I should also say that you'll hear some other terms for MAT. So you might also hear MOUD, medication for opioid use disorders or MAUD, medication for alcohol use disorders. So presenters and uh, speakers may be using those interchangeably. Our featured presentation will be with Dr. Joy Brunson and Suka. Um, okay, as always, you guys found yourself here. So you most likely know this website, but talk.crisisnow.com. You can register for the crisis jam, which you have to do to get in and everyone has to register individually, but also you can get all of the previous materials, like uh, click on previous um, recordings, so all that's great. And then uh, the last week's crisis jam, if you did not see that, go ahead and check it out. It's on um, models of funding. This is great. We, I know we all are coming down from our Olympics high. So uh, as you may remember in 20, uh, the previous Olympics, Simone Biles had to pull out for mental health issues. She got a lot of flack for that. And she came back really strong in this Olympics, obviously, but did a great deal of talking about how the necessity to care for herself also led to her current successes um, and also did a good clap back at her critics. Um, I, we have want to talk a little bit about the 988 Day Activation Workshop that SAMHSA hosted. And I believe we have a speaker, uh, Stacey Pulaski. Are you in the room with us? I am, Aisha. Oh, great. I'll turn it to you. Um, so some of you may have attended our really well attended workshop uh, earlier this week. And for those of you who did, we thank you. Um, on September 8th, which is 9-8, we are doing 9-8-8 day. Um, and we're encouraging organizations, everyone around the country to create, help us create positive buzz around 9-8-8. Um, and, uh, you know, any activity around the country is up for grabs. We want people to have fun, take selfies with 988 and no judgment, just help. This is a tagline that has been testing really well for us, which is why we have decided that we really want to use this phrase for this year for 988 day. Um, and we want folks to really just have fun with it. Um, and then anything that people do, we want you to be able just hashtag, hashtag 988 day in social media, um, whatever platform we have a wall that will be gathering every, what everyone around the country is doing. And, um, we'll be highlighting some things on the 98 lifeline social media throughout that day as well. Thanks so much, and congratulations on the day. I heard you all had a, uh, nearly a thousand folks join, so it just speaks to the importance of this work. Thanks for Thank talking you. about Thank it. You. Thank you. Um, oh, another. Uh, this is a little bit of a call to action, as you all know. Uh, Amer Moving America's Soul on Suicide is a fantastic um, uh, movie that you can reach on YouTube. And now the uh, Crisis Show folks are trying to hit a million viewers. They're very, very close. So go ahead, get out your phone, scan that QR code to get you to uh, YouTube, or go to the website there on the top of the uh, uh, slide and take a look if you haven't seen it, or watch it again. It's worth watching again. All right. One of my favorite parts of the jam, crisis trivia hot seat. Um, <clears throat> so this one is a... Uh, this one is for all of us. This is so we are all now on the hot seat. We don't have a specific person. So everyone put on your thinking caps. This question is from the vault, about two and a half years old. So if you've been here before, you got an advantage. Dr. Margie Balfour is a psychiatrist and national leader in crisis care, QI, and police response at Connections Health Solutions. She reports that 15% of adults present to their crisis facilities with substance use disorder as primary. So the question is, as soon as the options pop up, how many have a substance use diagnosis and or a positive toxicology? 
Is it 35 percent, 45, 55, or 65? And you should see a pop-up screen where you can go ahead and choose. So um, good luck to us all, and let's see how we do. I hope everyone got the chance to choose widely. I'm excited to see uh, it's an extremely smart room of crisis jam participants. So I have high hopes for us getting this right. All right. So, all right. Well, actually, kind of a pretty relatively split room. So, uh, about a third of us, a little more than a third, thought 45, 55, and then 65, kind of split. So, let's see how we did. Um, and the answer is 65%. Methamphetamine and alcohol accounted for 75% diagnoses um, and crisis receiving services benefit from medically because of that. We know that crisis services benefit from medically monitored detoxification capabilities and other types of evidence-based um, substance use treatment. So uh, definitely a high number, but if, they, if you think about the SUD diagnosis and or positive toxicology, that's what really gets you up to that pretty significant uh, indication of comorbidity. So nice work, guys. Congratulations. Yeah, oh, yeah. Is Margie on? Yeah, go ahead. I am Margie. here. Yes. Um, and that's probably an underestimate because at that time, um, there's not a point of care, like urine tests that you can do, you know, without sending it off to like a, you know, like a, like a real lab for fentanyl. Um, I think we may have found one, um, you know, th those have been sort of slow to get developed, but um, so, yeah, so that doesn't really include people who would be positive only for fentanyl. Um, mm -hmm. The vast, when you like break it down in terms of what we did see, most of it, um, you know, this is, was on the West Coast, you know, in, in Arizona, um, where we have a lot of meth. So I think it's like 50% were positive for meth um, of those who were positive for something. Um, and then uh, I think it's like 25% alcohol, then followed by opiates. But again, that opiates is probably an underestimate. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. It's it's start to think about this maybe even being an undercount, but really hits home the idea that we can't have a system that really bifurcates care for mental health and substance use, um, particularly at the point of crisis. And there's also a question on age in the uh, chat if you have a chance. But yes, I also know we did have it broken down by age, and um, for kids, I think it was closer to like 35, 40, 35 percent. I think were positive or had a. A diagnosis, and for that, most of it was cannabis, followed by opiates and alcohol. Oh, thank you. Um, and then, congratulations on this coming forward. Do you want to talk a little bit about this book with you and uh, Dr. Goldman? Uh, sure. So, um, for those who are um, not familiar with Psychiatric Clinics of North America, they are a well known um, academic journal where every issue they invite guest editors and then it has a theme. And so Matt Goldman and I did the one that is coming out in this fall, I think in September, um, and it is on crisis services. So I think there's probably quite a few crisis jam participants who um, were off, were invited authors on some of these chapters, but it basically ends up being like a book. Um, and it um, has the table of contents, I think would be on the link there. But, um, you know, we tried to dig into some topics kind of in more depth. So um, there's uh, a chapter on youth services. There's chapters on on uh, achieving health equity. There's chapters on working with law enforcement, mobile crisis, crisis facilities. Um, so there's, you know, hopefully people will find this helpful. Um, and yeah, it comes out soon. So a lot of them, if you go to their website, a lot of them are online ahead of print already. 
um, but the actual like print version comes out in September. And it may be if you don't have access to a library, it may be behind a paywall. But if you're interested in any of the specific chapters, just send me or Matt an email and we can we can send those to you. Oh, that's a great offer, Margie. And I think it's undoubtedly people will find this uh, very useful. So congrats to you and Matt and to all of the authors on that. Fantastic work. All right, um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. I'm gonna bring up Dr. Dr. Joy Brunson Nisuka, um, who is the Chief Operating Officer at RI International. Joy, can I turn it to you? Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. So I would like to get started um, to talk about um, medication-assisted treatment. Um, as we talked about before, there's uh, MAT, there's MOUD, there's MAOUD. So we'll, we'll be using these terms uh, interchangeably throughout um, and also throughout this presentation. So I wanted to start with just some data um, from 2022 and 2023 to show the number of opioid uh, related overdose deaths in the U.S., as well as the number of individuals that report symptoms related to alcohol misuse. Um, even though these uh, statistics are down by uh, 3% in 2023, as you can see, it's still a big problem and also a, a big concern. And next slide. Even though it is a, a big concern right now, um, I wanted to make sure that we um, remember that during the mid 19th century, um, up until this point, we've had different waves of concerns with uh, opioids. Um, so thinking about the American Civil War, thinking about the discovery of morphine going through the uh, 1980s into the 2000s when we were um, in the wave of prescription um, pain pills and adding in the pain scale, um, looking at the second wave in 2016, and now um, we're, we're calling this wave that includes uh, fentanyl and xylazine. The, the actual fourth wave. So this has been an issue um, for years, um, and now it's really getting the focus that it needs um, as, as far as treatment and care and working to decrease that stigma. So understanding what medication-assisted treatment is, um, it is a comprehensive approach to treating substance use disorders, thinking about that medication and therapy all, all together, um, looking at basic needs, making sure um, we are looking at the whole patient approach to care. Um, it, it's not a kind of one-size-fits-all, but really working to make sure that the individual's concerns are addressed. Um, as far as the substance use disorder, and that medication is, is a part of that. Um, it is a harm reduction approach, um, so it isn't an abstinence only, but really meeting the individual where they are, um, working on the physical and psychological aspects of addiction, while also uh, supporting with uh, behavioral therapies and counseling as well. And, and research has also shown um, that this approach also enhances the overall community well-being. So how does it work? Um, so it's medications, like I said, medications and counseling. Um, some of the medications that you probably heard before um, are methadone, buprenorphine, vivitrol, naltrexone, um, they work um, to support the brain chemistry and to block the euphoric effects of alcohol and opioids specifically, um, and also to work with relieving cravings and, and working on um, for individuals not to go in, in into uh, withdrawal. And so being able to support someone from a physical standpoint with medication um, really supports them to be able to um, work with a counselor, work with support services, um, and 
by having this approach, it really helps to significantly increase an individual's ability to sustain recovery, help prevent relapse, and really work with um, individuals on all of the other things that, that, that they have um, going on as well, while the medication uh, supports them from a physiological standpoint and um, normalizing that brain chemistry. So it's all of that together um, to help someone um, that is um, having opioid use disorder or alcohol use disorder and, and making sure that they have the tools that, that they need um, to sustain their recovery. So for recovery innovations, we started looking at um, the gaps that we were seeing for our facility-based crisis services across the country. Um, and the gaps that we were seeing specifically related to individuals that were coming into these crisis facilities that we have. Um, and we were not able to address the individual's needs. We were not keeping up with, with the research um, and the evidence-based practices. And so with that, we were seeing that uh, over 80% of the individuals that were coming into our facilities, um, and we are across the country, so, so that number can vary um, based on um, the actual location, but at our highest, we were at 80%. Um, we were not able to address their individual needs of those individuals um, because we were not offering MAT at that time. We were offering detox, um, detoxification services, but not MAT. So we started working towards addressing these gaps in 2018. So some of the steps that, that we took, um, we started with research. Um, and we started in a, a community-based approach, a systems approach. Um, so we started with research, and at first we started looking at uh, whether our local hospitals could uh, support um, based on some of the research and articles um, where EDs were starting to do inductions of buprenorphine. Um, but within the community that we started, um, we determined that the crisis facility would be a, a better approach. So we started with research on how we could do this, um, looking at the three-day rule to make sure that we were in compliance. We did a data review on, um, on the individuals that were coming into the facility. We did a community assessment to see exactly how many o OTPs were in the community, how many OBOTs were in, in the community, and, and making sure that we had um, a good referral source because starting someone on treatment or continuing someone um, in, in treatment, we needed to have a good follow-up plan. So we had to do a good community assessment to make sure we had good pathways um, to, to be able to support this work. We updated our screenings and assessment tools, uh, making sure that we had appropriate tools to screen um, for um, opiate use disorder and for um, alcohol use disorder. Um, we actually started utilizing um, the fentanyl dips into our point of care um, urine drug screens as well um, to be able to get um, a more accurate uh, count of individuals that were coming in. Um, we had to do make sure the medications were available. There were so many steps to make sure um, we had everything that, that we needed. And, and as you can imagine, um, with, throughout the country, um, DEA rules can change, the, the local county rules can change. So we had to do this over and over and over as, as we moved this, this process uh, across the country. So making sure we had the medications available, pro proper protocols, and training of our team members. The training of our team members um, was one that we took a lot of care and focus on be, because um, these were the individuals that were going to be greeting all of our um, guests when, when, when they came in. What, what we found, which we thought was very interesting, was that there was a difference um, in our team members um, and their view on starting medication-assisted treatment with, within the facility. And, and, and what that means is that within the facility, um, we have a lot of peer support specialists um, who are fantastic at working with individuals in recovery, talking about their own lived experience, but also had a definite view on medication-assisted treatment. 
So a lot of training and time um, went into making sure that our team members were up to speed. They were aware of this evidence-based practice and why we were starting to actually go down this path for individuals. And then finally, it was implementation and then um, continued uh, analysis. Next slide, please. So we, we started off small. Um, we started with one pilot project. We had some successes. And in that pilot project, we started with um, inductions of buprenorphine on our unit. We started uh, with continuations of buprenorphine if someone came in for a different crisis reason. And we started with um, continuations of methadone if someone came in for a different crisis reason. Um, those were all successful, and now um, since then we have also moved to offering a Vivitrol as an option, and we've also uh, moved to offering buprenorphine-assisted uh, withdrawal process as well, as it helps with the withdrawal symptoms, and then making sure that we are uh, able to assist people with with just being more comfortable uh, during that process when when they're they're in the facility. So we we saw a lot of success with that one pilot project, but we also saw some challenges. And some of those challenges were centered around the myths um, that that are around uh, MAT. We, we saw that, we saw the, this within the facility and we saw it within our external partners as well. Um, and, and some of the challenges that, that we had externally was uh, within our community, housing options when we would discharge someone weren't readily available anymore, um, talking to individuals um, in the community about resources that we typically had used before, um, but we couldn't use um, for the individuals that were now um, on um, medication assisted treatment. And, and so we had a lot of work to do as a system to make sure that, um, that individuals got the support that, that, that they needed. We also determined that we needed to start our own um, bridging um, OBAC clinic um, because we lacked uh, capacity in the, in the community in order to discharge someone um, effectively when we had finished our treatment within the crisis space. Next slide, please. And, and then overall, we just saw a very big difference um, within our substance use community, our overall behavioral health community. Um, if we can keep going through through this slide, um, to as as we started to work to make sure um, that we had the, the resources that we need to needed to provide this service. And so there was this push and pull between our thoughts on harm, harm reduction versus uh, detox. There was a push and pull for the cost of it um, and also who had access to it. And then there was a, a push and pull around what we know as addiction as a, as a disease. Um, and MAT as evidence-based treatment for that, and the, the thought to uh, criminalize uh, behaviors. Um, and, and there was just this push and pull that, that we kept having um, throughout the community as we started this service back in, in 2018 and, and worked with this internally for our own staff and then externally um, with our community as well. But since then, we've seen a lot of changes over the landscape, a lot of changes. Um, as we have learned all the things that, that we started, all, all the barriers that, that we had to get started, we've seen over uh, the last five to six years, uh, medications becoming more affordable, not only for our crisis facility to be able to provide them, but also um, medications for individuals to be able to um, su support their treatment becoming more affordable. We've, we've seen communities that we're in um, have more of an increased focus on harm reduction methods. Um, we actually have a syringe exchange programs um, outside of, of some of our um, facilities as well. So we are starting to really um, become partners in, in, in the community. We've seen relaxing of regulatory systems. 
Um, specifically one that, that I'm thinking about is related to the X waiver for physicians and that training time. Um, we've seen more bipartisan uh, support for treatment as, as well as the opioid sell settlement dollars, which has also helped. So, so now the bridge um, clinic that we started in our pilot program, there isn't as much of a need for it because of, of all the things that have relaxed. And then a response to critical of critical community systems. We've seen EMS started doing inductions in the field. We've seen ED starting to do inductions. Um, we've seen our detention centers um, starting to do inductions and continuations. And, and so we, we've just seen a relaxing um, of a lot of these systems over time that has helped us push our efforts forward. And lastly, the go forward. Um, as I mentioned before, we are in the fourth wave. We have um, seen an increase, of course, in fentanyl and xylazine, which is changing um, the, the way our services are being provided. We're, we're seeing um, much higher uh, doses being required for individuals. We, we've seen more micro dosing being required. Um, so, so really, we've had to continue to evolve over the, the, the last five to six years to make sure that we're keeping up with um, the substances that, that are out there. And it's an ever evolving um, system. And, and so from my perspective going, going forward, as we think about the crisis continuum, the call center, the mobile response teams, and the crisis facilities, making sure that we are thinking about substance use services as a part of the whole overall behavioral health services, and it's not separate, it is, it is included, and that we have the appropriate assessments and screenings, tools, resources, training on evidence-based practices like MAT, um, and making sure that we're integrating these services so that individuals um, are able to get referred to the, the resources that best fit their, their needs. And, and as we continue to do this, we'll, we'll be able to continue to serve the whole person that is in crisis. And I know I'm probably running out of time, but I would like to make sure I highlight that August 31st is International Overdose Awareness Day. It is August 31st of every single year. Um, you, you can find resources online. Um, these are just some of the, um, the social media posts and all of that. They, they have them available for you, already created. Um, so I just want to make sure that I plugged, because this is something that we, um, we make sure that we recognize that our eye. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that I did talk about that here. It is August 31st. Thank you so much, Joy. That was fantastic. Um, and often this group puts questions in the chat, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, but in the meantime, I want to call forward our roundtable discussants. Um, first, we have Dr. Rochelle Head Dunham. Rochelle. Good morning. Um, thank you all for this opportunity. And, and more importantly, Joy, I really, really appreciate those introductory comments. Um, I want to just share a few thoughts with you all. I was asked to do a high level review, I guess, because I'm an addictionologist and I've worked in this area of medicine for 34 years now. Uh, but a couple of things that uh, sort of gleaned over the years. Um, first of all, I like the acronym MSUD because we are talking about medicines for substance use disorder uh, to include tobacco. Uh, tobacco probably has more medications that are available for use and is definitely the leading cause of preventable deaths um, for, from substances. So we can't forget about um, tobacco use. Uh, but in the context of um, MOUD, just three things I want to mention uh, that are important and relevant. First of all, Joy has already mentioned harm reduction. Um, Medications for substance uh, use disorders is harm reduction. Uh, it is a significant component of harm reduction because it is the primary means at which we decrease morbidity and mortality. Um, uh, we see that most with opioid overdosages, but historically we've always seen that in uh, the treatment of substance use disorders, alcohol and benzodiazepines also being uh, very dangerous uh, in high dosages and a cause for um, 
mortality and morbidity as well. So it is absolutely a part of harm reduction, but it also is a component of relapse prevention. When we talk about prevention and in, in, uh, addiction treatment, it's important to get on the front end of the problem and not spend so much time on the back end of chasing uh, symptoms that are far more out of control or more complicated to manage. So it is a component of relapse prevention. And then, of course, acute management, as I stated, because most people die from substance use because of the physical sequelae that occur uh, when using substances. And so acute management is critical, uh, and that often requires um, a hospital admission or an admission to a residential 3.7 um, withdrawal management type unit for services. So medications for opioid use, substance use are critical. The other point I want to make is about um, co-occurring disorders. Uh, in the world of addiction, uh, co-occurring disorders is the rule. It is not the exception. And what I mean by that is that you have to look for it. If you don't look for substance use, you're going to miss it. And most of the data that is out there that is not taking into consideration professionals who are actually intentionally doing the appropriate screenings and the appropriate assessments are missing substance use disorders. Also something that you cannot eyeball and see. Um, I've done this for many years and I will never tell you that somebody walks into my office and uh, I can tell you whether they're a user or not. That also includes alcohol. You don't always smell intoxication. And so you have to test for it. And so um, looking for it is critical because it is more likely there than not in the context of um, the presence of a mental illness or not. So uh, uh, it is the rule for co-occurring disorders, so we have to look for it. The other thing is that um, we have to treat substance use disorder and mental illness both as primary conditions. Treating one and exception of the other is only gonna allow for an exacerbation of symptoms from the one that's not treated. It's also gonna also ultimately undo whatever treatment you've done for the one that you've not made primary. So if we are treating substance use disorder, we have to be very, very conscientious about looking for mental illness. And if we're treating mental illness, we have to be very, very conscientious about looking for substance use disorders. Um, there's a very complex interplay neurobiologically, psychologically between these categories of uh, mental illness. And so we have to be astute about making sure that anybody who's touching one is also aware that they need to be looking for the others. These are chronic relapsing conditions over time, uh, they will ultimately undo whatever good work we're doing. So just a few comments about medications for opioid or substance use disorder. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, you're getting a lot of uh, validation in the chat as well. Um, next up, Dr. Carlisle Johnson. Hello. Um, I, first of all, I just want to echo everything Dr. Um, uh, had done just talked about I was going to talk about co-occurring illness and I will skip that it was done so much better than I was going to say it. Um, I work within a health plan in North Carolina that covers Medicaid and uninsured for uh, seven counties about a third of the state and um, one of the things that I've observed is that if we approach this crisis as health plans and as counties and as providers and as separate silos we really missed the boat on being able to integrate systems of care, find ways to promote low threshold access to care, and, and find a way that our community benefits from the interventions we're working on. Um, some of the critical things that we, we really have been focusing on a lot is involving people um, with lived experience in the process of, um, of getting into care. If you think of someone who's been engaging or trying to engage with our healthcare system and may have very limited trust in that system. It, it really helps to have someone who has that lived experience who can help them navigate. Also, it's a lot harder to navigate a system where mental health and substance use are separated as separate silos than one where they're integrated together. And so um, anything we can do to promote that integration makes uh, a, a world of a difference. Um, we're also doing a lot of work within systems such as the criminal justice system. and. Um, if any of you are interested in this area, it's, I think, a critical area for all states to be looking at. Um, essentially, in most county detention centers across the, across the country, most prisons, uh, if you are receiving medication for opioid use disorder and are incarcerated, you are not able to stay on the methadone or buprenorphine or other products that you are receiving in the community. 
We know from research that the risk of overdose is 40 to 50 times higher in the two weeks after release than the general population. And um, it's an excellent opportunity to maintain people on their medication. It's also um, our federal government has clarified it is a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution to deny treatment for opioid use disorder within detention centers. So um, many detention centers are getting on board with expanding treatment to be compliant with ADA and Eighth Amendment. Others are being litigated to that point, but we're working with the systems of criminal justice as well as hospitals, EMS post overdose response. And really, I think the, the ideal to me is to bring together all the partners, um, put aside any territoriality or, um, or, or blinders as far as, as how to approach this and start with the end in mind and say, how do we engage people at the point they're at, meet them where they're at and get them into treatment, eliminate the barriers um, and particularly some of the financial barriers, some of the bureaucratic barriers. There are wor workarounds that I think are the the, the critical work of, of collective impact groups to find, to make our system more accessible, low threshold access, easy to get into treatment, and also systems that do not kick you out of treatment for displaying the symptoms of substance use that got you in, such as testing positive for marijuana if you're in an opioid treatment program. So um, there, there's so much that can be done. I, I appreciate you focusing on this and uh, um, thanks for inviting me. No, oh, thank you. That was fantastic. And thanks also in particular for raising the criminal justice system where for many of our counties, the, our jails are the primary or largest behavioral health provider. And too often they're not providing uh, MS2D and certainly, as you noted, moving people around in terms of what they're getting. So thank you so much for that. Next up, Mr. Lem Scott, your reflections. Lem, are you here? Oh, oh, okay. Well, we seem to have lost Lem uh, at this moment. Um, and if he joins the next couple of seconds, we'll be able to get him on. Um, but given that, I want to just open it up um, a little bit now in case uh, the other folks in the room that might have uh, additional comments that there are questions that they'd like to raise. Um, I know I know Margie, you've already spoken, but you've done tons of work um, on this topic. Um, or otherwise, uh, Joy, if you yourself would like to uh, come forward. Joy, you're muted. Well, let me ask this, uh, Joy, since we have a couple minutes, I know one of the earlier questions in the chat was just, uh, or one of the comments was uh, really talking just about uh, how much they really appreciated the steps that you all took to really shift the way your system focused on substance use disorders. It just, I know this is a big question in probably two <laughs> minutes, but where did you, could you talk through some of the steps that were the, mo the most challenging for you and what some of the specific changes you made were? Sure. Um, I, I think the steps that were um, the most challenging for us, um, and my, my background is in, in, in system, so I, I like to really focus on the entire system when, when we're making changes. Um, I, I think one that was the most challenging was setting up that, um, that follow through and that aftercare. Um, I, I think that part of it is critical and important. Um, crisis services are all, always going to be short term. So, so making sure that there is um, not only a family education, um, making sure that we provided um, Narcan kits and training on, on, on kits, making sure that we provided comprehensive follow-up care and appointments that included um, supportive supporting basic needs, like that whole process, I, I think um, was challenging and, and making sure that we had the right supports in, in, in place. Uh, as, as, as I talked about, our community when we started wasn't as receptive um, to, the, to what we were trying to do. Um, so we really had to have a lot of discussion um, around on what was needed, um, making sure that we had all, all the pieces in place. Um, 
I think at that point, the easiest was uh, getting uh, the Narcan kits because there was a lot of push in, in, in the area to provide those. But all of the other pieces, including making sure individuals were able to thrive in the community once they discharged was, was probably one of the most challenging for us. That's fantastic. Thank you. I, I think one of the one of the cha most challenging things you do hear about making these types of changes is noting where the resistance is inside the house, like where your your own challenges, your own staff, your own culture has to shift and to really incorporate this type of care. Um, and then absolutely that sort of making sure people are uh, connected and stable after they leave your doors. So thank you so much, Joy, and thanks for the work. Uh, thank you to all of our discussants. Um, you know, other other folks on the call, please do jump in in the chat with your thoughts, questions. We've got folks. Uh, Margie, I just saw you click on video. Did you want to jump in? Oh, yeah, and just um, echoing everything that was was said, and you know, the in starting people on you know Medicaid assisted treatment, like you know, like Suboxone, for example, that was actually the easiest part. Like, you know, training the docs and training the nurses, like that part was actually straightforward and easy. The hardest part then was figuring out how, if we're going to start people on this path, how do we make sure that they have the right follow-up? And in the early days of the opiate epidemic, we actually couldn't get people in within like a day or two and had to start our own opiate clinics, which we've, you know, since divested from, but um but it's really those partnerships, you know, working with agencies to get us the Narcan and, you know, and things like that, like knowing who to connect people to. And there's still a ton of stigma out there. There's still a lot of homeless programs that won't take people who are on any kind of medication assisted treatment. I mean, and that's a huge problem. Um, you know, so a lot of that stigma that exists, just systemic stigma still needs to be addressed. And then, you know, opiates, um, we're very lucky that we've got some really good treatments for that, um, as well as alcohol and tobacco. Um, what we still struggle with the most is meth. And, um, you know, I had a little cadre of, when we had our opiate clinic, a little cadre of, of patients who were doing really well in terms of their opiate addiction, but couldn't kick the meth. And then the meth has fentanyl in it, you know, and so it's risky. And, um, you know, there's some emerging evidence of, um, you know, there, there's a, a lot of them that had co-occurring ADHD and no one would give them stimulants because they had a substance use history and, you know, all that stigma, I think, also plays into to how successful the, these folks can be in getting the right treatment. No, thank you so much for um, for raising that and for um, validating what you've heard, but also uh, talking about the struggles that you all had and how you got around them. So really appreciate it, Margie. Thanks for jumping back in. Um, okay, um, we are going to go ahead and get to our partner updates. So Dr. Belina Shaw for SAMHSA, can I bring you forward? Good afternoon. Um, glad to be here on the Crisis Jam again for the CMSA update. Um, a, a few updates, and I just also want to comment a little bit on that great discussion on co-occurring disorders and substance use disorder. Um, I am an addiction psych psychiatrist as well, and I used to chair our overdose fertility review team in our local community. And I will just say that um, there were so many people that we had seen who had died and that and who had passed away from from opioid related deaths but when we look back at their history we only saw mental health or maybe alcohol but not necessarily that opioid and so i just want to reiterate, reiterate that this is really a life-saving uh, um concept and this is not just a, a good to do um, but this no wrong door really can save lives because you really just don't know um, all of the depths of someone's history and needs until you really start to understand them and I love the term MSUD, um, just thinking about not uh, actually not specific to alcohol or, or opioids, but just in general, when we talk about the older term MA, MAT, um, MAT is thinking it's medication assisted treatment, but just decreasing stigma one other and one other layer, medications for opioid use disorder, alcohol use disorder, tobacco, whatever those, medi those medications may be, that those all are, are treatment in themselves and that they're not assisting the treatment. So I'm just so glad to hear the terms shifting um, from there. And I love the MSUD, I've never heard that, but I look forward to using it. 
Um, and so um, one last thing is also making sure that you do have I, I love how Joy mentioned that that they they did the comprehensive assessment. And I would add the and to that is that if you don't have the medications available and say you look at your own data in, a, in, in an institution or organization, if you don't have the medications available, people will underreport. We saw that in our jail, that as soon as we started offering the medications, that people started increasing the reporting because there was a reason. So also just if you think it's not really a problem, you may not know the extent of the problem until people feel like there's a need to tell you, otherwise it's stigma wipe off. So my really quick SAMHSA update is that um, we uh, next week are having a summit focused on the national guidelines. Um, as you probably have heard in this, um, uh, this, this context before, we are working on several guidance documents related to the crisis continuum all simultaneously. I love seeing Microsoft Word every day, um, but they are the Mobile Crisis Toolkit, which I will say is co-funded by the Center for Mental Health Services and the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment through the, the block grants. Um, and so, and then also with support of the 988 office um, as well. So just, just once again, we're, we know that this is, needs to be a co-occurring approach. That document is well under, on its way. Um, we are also working on standards and definitions, clarifying what exactly does each of these levels of care mean and, and um, just really cre creating um, some outlines for the puzzle pieces, as I like to say, so that we know what those shapes are exactly. And then the third the guidance document is an update to the national guidelines. We know that the 2020 guidelines were created prior to the 988 rollout, and there's some other really exciting things that are going on now with um, moving towards geo routing, et cetera. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're up to date with this very burgeoning, growing field and the crisis care continuum. And um, we will be assembling a group of experts to um, review some drafts of these of some of these documents and helping us to give give feedback and, and really pack practice based evidence, um, knowledge and understanding that they'll share with us knowing that, um, that this there's just a lot to learn. So um, we're looking forward to this iterative process. There will still be opportunity for public comment for these documents and stay tuned. Um, and that's my major sub uh, SAMS update. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have the Nashville update, Wendy Morris. All right, well, hello everyone. Uh, great to be here. I'm gonna spend uh, my update talking a little bit about um, our transformation transfer initiative or TTI here. Um, in 20, 2007, rather, SAMHSA, in collaboration with NASHBID, created the TTI to really help states to transform their mental health systems of care. It's a kind of a modest funding um, that's awarded on a competitive basis to really help states um, and territories with some new innovative ideas. It's very flexible funding, and it can be used either for a new initiative or expansion of one um, that's already underway. It can focus on one or multiple phases of system change. And then in addition to that funding um, that can be awarded to the states, there's been a creation over the years of resources such as informational exchanges, social marketing material and resource guides that are uh, helping those who are participating in an initiative. We have a phenomenal team at NASHBID uh, of folks who, who help the awardees uh, they provide a lot of technical assistance, link them to other states or other resources to help move their projects along. And we also partner with NRI, the Nashbid Research Institute, who helps states with evaluations. So through this TTI over the years, SAMHSA has invested more than $50 million to over 250 innovative initiatives that have spanned 49 states, five territories, and the District of Columbia. So over the years, the topics have varied, but for the past three years, um, they have focused on crisis services, and that includes um, 988. So in 2024, some of those specific topics were rapid access, workforce, support employment, high-risk populations, 988, and 911 collaboration. If you visit our website, there's a brief description of every project. There were 50 projects, uh, 50 awards made in 2024, and the reason I'm talking about it today is because we are just wrapping up this week. We're having our final calls with the states for their technical um, assistance portion. They'll continue that work and have um, evaluation meetings with NRI in a few months. 
but we're also about to embark on the application process for 2025. So I just want to make sure folks know that it's available. Um, while we are not able to publicly share the topics for 2025, we have had a, a sneak preview of what we believe they'll be. And I think we're going to see some exciting things um, come out of it. So we're hoping folks will look for those applications. They'll be available on our website um, at the beginning, early part, maybe, maybe mid-September. Um, the State Mental Health Authority can apply for those, but if you don't work for a State Mental Health Authority, I would uh, encourage you to seek seek them out and see if there's opportunity for collaboration, either on a TTA pro TTI project or, or maybe some other projects. And we know that uh, collaboration can lend itself to some great collective impact and really exponentially improve outcomes and, and get some synergy going to move things along. So um, maybe more to come about that next month. So thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Wendy. We'll keep an eye out for those applications. Exciting. All right. Um, next up, Stephanie Hepburn to talk with us about an article that's a couple years old, but is just as relevant today as it was then on stigma and MAT in the uh, recovery community. Stephanie, go ahead. Aisha. So I'm going to bring on Dr. Chuck. Um, so the article focused on persistent stigma against MSUD. Um, I love that. Thank you for that. I think that was Dr. Head Dunham um, in the peer recovery community. And uh, the interviewee for the article is an award winning peer recovery coach. Um, who credits ongoing MSUD and caring recovery coaches for her own recovery, um, but she's also witnessed uh, persistent stigma within the recovery community, um, so much so that she hasn't felt comfortable sharing her experience. And I wanted to bring on Dr. Chuck to get his thoughts. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, it's really interesting. I, I just realized I was gonna be doing this within a short period of time, and I bumped into Veronica uh, earlier this week, not knowing this was coming up, and she's doing fantastic as always. Yeah. I would have loved to have asked her because well, this is one of those yeah. things. Just like when I talked with Tom uh, Betlock uh, last week about how Medic his article had changed since 2023, and this article was what uh, several years ago. That's right. It was 2019. Yeah. yeah. So um, it it mirrored um, what some of the things that Joy described that we had to combat within our staff of stigma. Um, although the article I loved, it also talked about stigma within the general population. Um, I, I do feel like that both within um, my experiences professionally within our staff, as well as seeing things in the general population and in the general medical community, there's been such an improvement from where it was when this article came of decrease in stigma, such as seeing, you know, changes in emergency department procedures. Um, finally starting to see new uh, options for folks who are coming out of crisis and need next supports for like residential substance use treatment being allowed to be on MSUD as part of their uh, regimen. And then uh, the best part is seeing the change in stigma within our staff, which is who, which is who I get to see the most. We actually now uh, at, at RI have staff members who are open about their uh, use of, of MOUD or other uh, alternatives and share that. And it's become, we've seen just an overall trend in that so improving. It doesn't mean there's still not a long way to go. I can tell you about a very challenging discussion in a local county talking about it. And some of the decision makers having so much um, misunderstanding of what this is all about and what it can do. So um, the article was fantastic of stating that. I think it still totally applies today, but I do share a hope that I really have seen improvement from my experience. I think. I think Veronica would say the same thing. I wish I, I had known love, this was coming up and, and yeah. say, hey, would you like to have been? I just didn't know it was coming. I would love to do a follow-up with her to see if her sentiments have changed. I mean, I think one thing that stood out to me was one of her quotes um, and she was talking about, and that kind of reminds me of what you were talking about at, at the community meeting, but she said that at a team meeting, um, a colleague vented that Narcan enables people um, addicted to opioids saying, we'll bring them back and they will just use again. And she didn't respond in the meeting. Um, but internally, and what she told me is, you know, it took me multiple times to get there. What if people at the clinic had just given up on me? Where would I be? Um, you know, we want to do our best to create an environment for people to get the help that they need when they need it. And so that's, you know, I'm curious, you know, you know, you've got 
and I think Dr. Balfour mentioned this too, you have this sort of, you know, systemic, I feel like we've done a great job um, as a society pushing back on depression and anxiety. And it's almost been, it seems like more digestible for people um, in this concept for some reason with SUD, it seems to be, uh, the stigma seems to be holding tighter. And I just was wondering if you've seen that as well, um, you know, in that community meeting, you know, can you share a little bit about what you were seeing? Ooh, it was a educated uh, person with multiple years of postgraduate work mm-hmm. using some of the typical uh, myths uh, and, and stigma about MOUD that SAMHSA has great tips and things to share for the family on their website to help combat and raw data that helps completely say, no, that's actually completely false. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but I think that uh, it's something that's that, that's out there still. Uh, but like I said, overwhelmingly, there's so much of a stronger voice on the other side combating that and, and doing that. And I, I see it on the funder side. Um, and that's what I think is just so important for this crisis jam. And I hope this session continues to help push forward this idea of this is a really important part of our overall services that we offer to the people that come in in crisis at all layers of that call center, having resources and understanding about those things, mobile teams having understandings and where they fit within that, all areas of the continuum, and then that next follow-up step like Margie discussed and Joy discussed. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Chuck. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both. And actually, I'm gonna just see if Tanja Miles is here and could give just a quick a uh, very quick reflection because Tanya, I know you've done a ton of great work in this space as well. So yeah, so can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. So I'm just super excited about you know everything that everybody's saying because at the end of the day, it's going to take all of us working together. And look, we know the data don't lie, and uh, because of the many people who are on this call, you know, right now in East Baton Rouge Parish, we have seen a decrease in drug overdose in the past six months on a continual basis. We have the data to prove it. And it's because we have certified peers who are on the street from 6 a.m. to 12 midnight, seven days a week, who go out on every POD. And when we encounter someone who is uh, has, has experienced a drug overdose, a non-fatal, we're able to talk to them about MAT, about treatment. And, you know, we're grateful for the Bridge Center that if they're ready, they can go straight there. And also, if that, you know, person is uh, fatal, we're offering hope, you know, resources, Narcan, fentanyl testing strips and things like that to their family members. And we're also going out in those hot spots where we see that drug overdoses are happening more every day and providing um, a lot of, you know, harm reduction. And we're talking to people about about MAT treatment. So we know it's working. And next week, I will be meeting with Senator Bill Cassidy who is the um, ranking file member uh, on the Senate education, um, all that other committee, because now there's no oversight for drug overdoses, uh, the, the settlement, the, the uh, opioid settlement money. And so he has asked, you know, me to help him to do legislation that'll be oversight, you know, among all states who are getting, you know, that settlement money. And of course, a big push is going to be to address treatment stigma like you guys talked about and how do we make sure that people know about Matt? Thank you so much, Tanja, for the work and for the wisdom. Now bring us home, Vic Armstrong with Strong Talk. Thank you so much. The way we individually and collectively navigate and make sense of the world, the way we define ourselves is heavily influenced by lived or living experience. The way the things that we live, the things we're taught and the things we consistently hear, including beliefs and norms about mental health and addictions that may be passed on from generation to generation. This experience helps us form our narrative of the world. It's the way we frame things, the way we make sense of the world. It helps us find our community and write our story. As I was preparing these words for today, I found a definition that described community as a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. We are a community united in service, and we have a story. And the good thing about this story is that we're not just the actors. We are the authors, the creators, and the conductors of our own story. And our story is not a tragedy. It's not a horror flick, and it's 
certainly not a romantic comedy. Our story, the story of this community, is about is an epic about a community coming together from different organizations, different races, cultures, ethnicities, sexual orientation, and geography, uniting as one behind a common cause, creating help that feels like help, creating community that feels like community. And it's one community, one crisis services community with one story, we can be the change we wish to see. As one community, we can transform to a crisis response system created in partnership with individuals with lived experience, a system designed to protect and nurture the individual experiencing a mental health emergency, rather than a system designed to protect the rest of us from the individual experiencing a mental health emergency. As one community, we can move from being an under-resourced mental health system to a system that has the resources and culture and humility to meet the never-ending demand for hope help and connection, a system that reimagines connectivity, reengages our communities and reestablishes relationships with communities where people live, work and play. Our story, the story of this community is not just a story about the fight, the fight for resources, the fight to overcome stigma and discrimination, the fight to decriminalize mental illness. It is a story of resilience. It's a story of perseverance and a story of victory. I know that sometimes we can all in this fight become weary. We can all become frustrated. We can all become discouraged, even fearful. But that is the beauty of having a community with you. That is the beauty of our story. And in closing, in the words of former First Lady Michelle Obama, history has shown us that courage can be contagious and hope can take on a life of its own. We are. One community, one story, and that is Strong Talk. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here today for this discussion on um, MSUD and crisis services. Next week, we have uh, 988 uh, and a focus on LGBTQ youth uh, and specialized services. So meet us here next Wednesday for that. And thank you all. <laughs>